invisible war with the demons of hell and with the devil himself. Do you realize that? I believe that every day. And I said this morning, and I'll say it again, we need to pray the devil off of some people because the devil keeps people from doing what is right. Is that right? The devil keeps people and his demons. So we've been studying the 16 D's of the devil here on Sunday night. And we're taking our text from Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 12 is our primary text verse. We, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have studied these numbers, these characteristics of the devil. Here they are. This is the ones we've studied. Disappointment, discouragement, despair, doubt, disbelief, distraction, double-mindedness, dishonesty, deceit, dullness. And last week we started on the uh, 11th topic of deadness, but we did not finish. So I want to make sure that we get everything that we need out of this one thought on deadness. I believe there are people, Christian people, who are walking around right now but are spiritually dead. That doesn't mean they're lost, but that means that they're not spiritually of any use whatsoever to God and to his service. They are walking dead, members of the body of Christ. Amazing. I gave you last week the case of Hophni and Phinehas. These two sons of Eli lived in pleasure in the temple, taking the meat from the altar and eating what they wanted for themselves instead of sacrificing it to God. They beguiled the women who came to the temple or to the type place of worship. I'm not sure at that time it's called a temple. But at that, at that particular time, they beguiled the women and committed adultery with the women and they were living in pleasure while serving in the house of God. Living in pleasure while serving in the house of God. That is, You say, preacher, that's awful. But I think that is what's going on across America today. Would you not say amen? People living in pleasure while going to the house of God. And so here's what uh, Adam Clark said about those uh, people that saw, here's the Israelites looking at Hophni and Phinehas and their actions in the uh, holy place. And here's what Adam Clark said. He said, men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Instead of loving it, instead of thinking it was holy, instead of thinking it was awesome, instead of thinking it was wonderful and great, and a sacrifice to be uh, known and to be pleased with and to be accepted and so on, they abhorred it. They didn't want to bring it. Didn't want to come and bring the offering. So the people saw that the priest had no holiness. The priest had no piety. And when they saw Hophni and Phinehas living in pleasure, then they began to act as if they were no God. And Adam Clark says, they despised God's service and became infidels. A whole nation becomes infidels because of two wicked sons of the priest Eli. And I also said this last week, the glory departed from Israel. And I won't go back into that story because I, I really like that story about Ichabod. But the glory departed from Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was gone. It was missing. The glory departed. And I want to say this. I want to say it again and again and again. I don't want to be just repeating myself, but I want to say this without apology. Anybody who lives in pleasure while in the house of God, this is an amazing thought. The glory departs from their life, and not only does the glory depart from their life, but the glory of God can depart from the entire church simply because people live in pleasure. I gave you the case of the widows. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 6, but she, liveth, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. I'm asking you now, we've been using the soldier theme here because of Ephesians chapter 6 is about the Christian soldier. And we've been using that theme. You are a soldier. Believer soldier is what you are. But believer soldier, do you realize that living in wanton pleasure is a condition of spiritual deadness? Do we really realize that living in wanton pleasure Careless, 
pleasure is spiritual deadness. Do we really realize that? James 5, 5 says this. You have lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton. You have nursed your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Do you know what wanton, W-A-N-T-O-N, means? Its meanings are deliberate. That means deliberate pleasure. Willful pleasure, willful. It means malicious, means malicious pleasure. Malvalent, that means bad. Spiteful pleasure, vicious pleasure, wicked pleasure, evil pleasure, cruel pleasure, unprovoked pleasure. That's what wanton means. So we get from the Greek dictionary that that simple definition of wanton is luxury. And we live today in a well-to-do era in which we live like kings, basically. You say, well, preacher, I don't, and you may not think you do, but if you go to Haiti and you compare Haiti people with this people in the United States, you would know real quick that we live like kings according to them. They would think you and I are very, very rich. But I wonder how many believers are living simply for luxury and pleasure. I wonder. I'm sure it would grieve the Holy Spirit to see Christian soldiers living the life of death instead of the life of faith and the life of living by faith. There is, though, an opposite to the state that I've been describing. I've been describing a terrible state of a believer, a believer soldier walking dead, living in pleasure. That's the walking dead. But there is an opposite to it. Thank the Lord for opposites. So here we have this verse, 1 Timothy 5, 5. And this is talking about the widows because I used the widows, the case of the widows about living in pleasure. One widow was living in pleasure. She was living in pleasure. She was dead while she lived it. Another widow was not living that way. So this widow was living for God. And here's what it says about her. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Now you see the difference between the two widows. One was living in pleasure and she was the walking dead, living as, as a dead person, dead while she liveth, the Bible said. But the other one was one that trusted in God, not only trusted in God, but prayed night and day. So you have two entirely different people, believers, one living in pleasure, but dead while she lived. Another trusting God and praying night and day. What a difference. Now, I don't mean to be overly <clears throat> uh, critical here, and sometimes I am, but I and Gail and I heard the story of a preacher close by here within a couple of miles of us that resigned his church over a $2,000 reduction in his salary because the church was having a hard time paying their bills. And that preacher said to the finance people and so on of this church, I cannot accept a $2,000 reduction in my salary. I must have, and I quote, at least $60,000 a year. And now this is a small church, not much bigger than this one, just a little bit bigger than this one. You say, preacher, uh, that's a pretty good salary. How many of you think 60000 pretty good? That's pretty good. Well, man, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? You say, oh, yeah. Folks, I, I'm not desiring $60,000 a year, not asking you that, but I want you to know I haven't come close to $60,000 a year here at Good News Baptist Church ever and don't plan to. And I'm not saying that to get an offering. I'm telling you, I've never made that money here at this church. But let me tell you, this guy quit, resigned, $2,000 reduction. And after he quit, he went to another church and took the money people in the church with him. <clears throat> let me tell you something. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. That's not right. How many of you would agree that's definitely, that is a preacher preaching for money. Is that right? And he's not supposed to do that. Now, you have to, they have to pay bills just like everybody else, and they have to have money to make it. But she, that preacher, was, in my opinion, living a wanton spiritual life or luxurious, at least living for luxury. Might have been as, not as luxurious as he wanted, but he was living for luxury instead of living 
for the things of God. I tell you what, folks, I think probably we need to start putting the right things first and God's will and God's way is better than man's way. Amen? And when people live for luxury, they are like living in pleasure but dead while they live. They're walking dead. <clears throat> According to the Bible, that preacher is dead while he's living. Dead while he liveth. I'm telling you, that's not a good place to be. I don't want to be, and you don't want to be, among the walking dead of the church. Amen? Amen. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be, to be dead, dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, we're not to be dead to righteousness, we're to be alive to God and alive to righteousness, dead to sin, but alive unto God. So we are to be dead to sin, but alive unto righteousness. But many believers have twisted that around. Many believers are dead to righteousness and alive to sin. It's exactly opposite. Now listen to what the Lord told the church at Sardis. You say, preacher, we're the only ones here and you're getting on to us and every time we come, you're the one, we're the ones that get it all. Well, I'm not necessarily speaking to you. We have a number of people that listen to us by way of the YouTube. Aren't you glad we have some listeners out there? In fact, one said today, one sent us an email just a little bit ago, I mean a text just a little bit ago and said they really enjoyed Tim's special this morning and really enjoyed the message this morning. Aren't you glad we got people that are watching? Amen. Thank the Lord for it. But <clears throat> here's what the Lord told the church at Sardis. Now, the Lord told the church this. He said, well, preacher, I don't want you fussing at me. Well, this is what the Lord told the church at Sardis. The Lord's not fussing. He's just telling what it is. He said this. And unto the, this is Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1 and following. And unto the angel of the churches of Sar in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. Wow. Now think about that. The Lord told the church, he said, you have the reputation that you're alive, that you're really doing it. You're really something else, but you're really dead. That's what the Lord told them. In other words, according to the people, according to the people of their day, a church at Sardis was really a vibrant church. But according to Jesus Christ, they were dead. Be watchful, it says. Here's what he tells that church, the dead church. The dead church at Sardis, here's what he tells them. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. Uh, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. And hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. Thank God for the few people that are not walking dead, that are not living in pleasure. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angel. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I'm amazed at that thought. You say, preacher, what are you amazed at? That the Holy Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of the scriptures, God the Father, I'll say to each and every one of us, hear what I've got to say. Let everyone that hath an ear hear. Do you have ears? You say, yes, sir, I do. Well, I don't hear too well. Well, you have ears. And if he said, hear. So are you hearing the word of God? Are you hearing what the Holy Spirit says to you? Am I hearing what the Holy Spirit says to me? I hope each and every one of you and those that are listening later, I pray that they will hear the word of God because it makes a difference what happens. There is uh, those who have believed in error so long that they are deaf to the words of God. I see that over and over again. They have a certain belief that they believe is the word of God and yet it is not the word of God and they believe it so strongly that they are deaf to the word of God. You could pick up the word of God and say this is what the Bible says about that era and they would say 
I don't believe it. My mama believed it. My grandmama believed it. My, my granddaddy believed it, and et cetera, et cetera. And they, I believe in so-and-so. And they are deaf to the real word of God. Hey, folks, I don't care who believed it in the past. If it doesn't come from the word of God, it's not Bible. Amen? It's got to come from the Bible. And you hope and pray that we hear what comes from the Bible. There are those who are dead in trespasses and sin. That's the lost people. And their mind is in darkness. And they cannot comprehend the light. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his light, eyes. That people are living in darkness that don't understand the spiritual things at all. And I think I've experienced that uh, firsthand this week. Seeing lost people who did not understand the word of God hardly at all at any point. The Lord has informed me uh, in time before I have preached messages to lost people, he has informed me some will believe and some will not believe. How many of you know that? When you go to preach to somebody or testify or give a witness or whatever and, and so on, if you give that witness, you know that some will not believe and some will believe. But I want you to know something. Just as I'm standing here right now, the Lord has also told me some people will hear what you say from the word of God and some people won't. And some people don't even want to. And that's what amazes me. Some run from the word of God. You say, well, why don't they come? They may be running from the word of God because it tells them the will of God and tells them what they ought to do and how they ought to live. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. So people actually run from the word of God. Because it tells them different things they need to do. But others live in darkness. They're dead in trespasses and sin. And they're all sorts of non-believers. All types and kinds. All different kinds. And some we would consider terrible sinners. And some we would say they were not terrible sinners. But surely somebody should be able to hear the word of God in their physical ear and in their spiritual ear and come under conviction and believe what God has said to them. Would you not pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, not only on the lost people that we preach to, but pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in our own hearts? Amen? Don't we need that same conviction? Amen? That same powerful conviction. So on this past uh, fr Friday at 2 o'clock, I had this outline, and I'm going to go over it real quick. It's in the bulletin as well, but I want you to get this outline. The Lord gave me Thursday and Friday night this outline. I preached it all night long. I was asleep, but I was preaching. How many of you believe that? I was asleep, but I was preaching. Here's the outline I was preaching. I didn't know what I was going to say Friday morning, uh, Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock. I didn't know what I was going to say. I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me. I got two messages to prepare for Good News Baptist Church. I got this message to prepare. You got to help me. And all during the night, Thursday night and Friday night, these two main words came up and then finally a third one. And this was all in the night, all in my sleep. Compassion. Compassion. And then this one kind of threw me for a curve. Creation. And then the last one finally came through was comfort. Now, I got up to write that down later so I'd have something in front of me to remember what I had thought about all night long and preached all night long. So I remembered compassion, and I remembered creation. And I knew what I wanted to do with creation because it's talking about the creation of the new man, the new heart. And I really wanted to preach on salvation, having a new heart, becoming a new individual in Christ Jesus. I really wanted to preach on that. And I really wanted to preach on compassion. But I couldn't remember when I got up. I couldn't remember the third one. I couldn't remember comfort. And I said, what in the world am I going to do? I can't remember. I said, I'm just, I tell you what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to preach the two that I remember, and the third one I can forget it. Because I probably won't have time anyway. So I opened my Bible to turn to the passage of Scripture I used in the funeral for the graveside, which is the passage in First Thessalonians about the rapture of the church and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the uh, resurrected body and when I went to 1 Thessalonians 5 it says at the end of that passage of scripture it says wherefore 
comfort one another with these words. I said, that's it. I forgot all about it. It's comfort. So I did two, compassion and creation in the funeral, and then I did comfort at the graveside. And I had the people repeat those three points. But I'll tell you something that amazed me about that thought. How many of you know this? John chapter 3, the Holy Spirit of God uses the new birth to tell us about how to be saved. John, uh, uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. How many of you know that? You must be born again. What did, the, what did the Holy Spirit do? He used the new birth, uh, birth, the physical birth. He used physical birth to tell somebody how to be saved. Now you say, preacher, I don't, I don't go to people and witness to them and tell them about the physical birth. Well, Jesus took a very learned man, Nicodemus, and the way he told him how to be saved was by using an illustration of physical birth. Well, I wouldn't do that, Lord. I mean, you know, that's the birds and the bees, and I don't want to talk about the birds and the bees to get somebody saved. But the Lord did. The Lord told Nicodemus, you must be born again. He's using that illustration of the physical birth. And I think every single one of us know about the things of physical birth. The seed of man has to be implanted for there to be a physical birth. Is that not a truth? And listen to this. The seed of the God-man, Jesus Christ, must be implanted in the heart of the individual in order for there to be conception, for, in order for there to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. And he does it through the avenue of the ear. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God goes in the ear and the Holy Spirit of God takes that word of God as it hits the you might say the womb of the be person, the being, the inner man, and it hits that womb, and the Holy Spirit of God can make that seed of the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, conceive and make a brand new creation. Is that right? Did he use the new birth, John chapter 3? Did he use birth to tell Nicodemus how to be saved? He did. Amen? Maybe we ought to use something that everybody knows about, the birds and the bees, not exactly all, in all those ramifications. But everybody knows about, should know, adults know about it. And even now kids are knowing about it. They've been taught it in school, along with critical race theory and other things. How ridiculous has our society become? Amen? Amen. But the Lord used something. You say, preacher, what's that? That new creation is a living creation. I don't know if you know it or not, but you are a living creation spiritually that will never die. So right now, there's so many pairs of ears here in this building that are hearing the word of God. And here's what I'm saying. This is the point I'm making. He that hath an ear, let him hear. You say, why? So that the word of God can go into your ear physically and to your heart or to your spiritual womb, so to speak, and conceive the truth of God. Praise God, we need that. And so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to have faith to believe what I'm preaching every single time I preach. Amen. The reason that things are not getting done spiritually is because faith is not, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Is that right? If you don't put faith with it, then there's nothing to it. Well, how do you get faith? So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then the Holy Spirit of God must take that faith and make a brand new creation. So you can have new life. You can have new life. Even though you're saved, even though you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That new creature can walk around like a dead person by living in pleasure. But if they listen to the word of God and by faith take that word through the Holy Spirit's power, they can have a brand new attribute of that new life, effective and operational in their life. I don't know what you think about that, but there's so many things in the word of God that we are said that we need to do and ought to do, etc. and I can name a number of them. Be holy for one thing. How many of you believe we ought to be holy people? Everybody believes that we ought to be holy people, but sometimes we're not. And so we say, well, Lord, help me. I need something from the word of God. My brother-in-law used to say he needed a verse for everything that he did. You need a verse to help you for something, and that means by faith that will give you the very thing that you're looking for. 
You can either live in pleasure and be dead while you live it, or you can be like that widow who was always trusting in the Lord and always praying. So now we have talked about deadness, but we need to come to another one. We come to, uh, I believe it's number 12 of these uh, um, different attributes. And so here we come to the war room. You know we've been using the war room every single Sunday night, and we have a war room in our minds, and we have a special operations unit. These are highly trained, highly efficient soldiers. These highly trained, highly efficient soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ are not walking in pleasure. They're not walking dead. They are living a life for Christ. They are special operations unit. They are soldiers who are sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are there in this quote, our war room. And as they are there in the war room, they are highly excited, but yet quiet about what the Lord, the captain of the host, is going to tell them. Their captain is going to come into the room and he's going to say, we've been talking about the uh, tactics of Satan, the tactics of the devil, and I have another one for you tonight. And here's the one I'm going to give you tonight. And so the captain, they're all in the room. They're all situated there. And they're, they're just, the, the area is thick. The, the, the air is thick. They are just, I mean, highly excited but quiet and, and, and anticipating what the captain is going to say. Because they know that whatever the captain says to them is a matter of life or death. How many of you do understand, and I need to understand this, do you not understand that our scriptures that we give each time we come is a matter of life or death? It determines whether we live for Christ or do not live for Christ. Every single time we come. The word is life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I'm the life. You want to live, you have to have Christ. Jesus is the one. And you've got to have him operational in your life. So the captain is going to come into the war room. And here's the captain. He walks into the war room. And as soon as he walks into the on time, every time. Jesus is always on time, every time. Amen? Amen? So Jesus walks into the room. He walks into the room of your heart. On time, every time. I promise you that. And he's got something to say to you. But Jesus, the captain, walks into the room, and as soon as he does, all the soldiers who are highly trained, highly efficient, walking in the spirit, walking in grace, not walking in pleasure, they jump to their feet, salute. And as usual, the captain says, the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain says, at ease. And as soon as he says, at ease, the men sit down. And then he says, tonight, gentlemen, I'm going to give you the 12th tactic of the devil and here it is and as he begins to say it the invisible hand begins to write with that finger that goes all the way back to Babylon and Belshazzar it goes D E L A Y he says gentlemen the next tactic of the devil is delay. And here's what he means by that. His lips are giving wisdom and they know it. Proverbs 15, 7 says, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Here's what delay means. He's given wisdom. Wisdom from the lips of the captain. At the great white throne judgment, it may be revealed that this deadly D of the devil has been used to damn more souls to hell than any other. And I'm going to include this note. I believe... False doctrines, like the false doctrine of speaking in tongues, has kept a lot of people, saved, uh, unsaved family members, from being saved. I'm going to tell you something. If I had an unsaved family member and I believed in a false doctrine like tongues, I would drop that false doctrine in a heartbeat so my family member could get saved. Amen? Amen? 
And if there's a false doctrine believed in your family or believed in your heart, that false doctrine may keep a lost family member from being saved because they see that false doctrine. I believe that some people can see that tongues is not of God even though they're lost people. I believe that think if I get saved, I got to speak in tongues. How ridiculous. Amen? Amen? We've been covering that on Wednesday night in the Wednesday night messages. I want you to know something. A young person that thinks, if I get saved, I've got to speak in that unknown tongue or speak in some kind of gibberish, then I don't want to get saved. That person who had been preaching to them, that false doctrine of speaking in tongues, is guilty of keeping them out of heaven. Amen? They are guilty of keeping their loved ones out of heaven by teaching them some false doctrine. It doesn't have to be just tongues. It could be any false doctrine for that matter. So I believe that there are plenty of people going to hell right now because somebody is intent on teaching them a false doctrine, whatever it may be. It has been remarked that many a man is in hell today who meant to get saved at the 11th hour. But the 11th hour never came. They died at the 1030 hour. It should be made clear to all sinners the terrible danger of procrastination. God has never promised to save a sinner tomorrow. God has never promised to save a sinner tomorrow. Here's what the Lord says. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When the Holy Spirit of God speaks to a heart, that is the day of salvation. Amen? That's the day. He does not promise them a second chance. Even though he may, he doesn't promise them that. James and the author of Hebrews warn of the danger of delay. Hebrews 4, 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day. Limiteth a certain day. Saying to da in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So he said, I'm amazed at that word again. He limited a certain day. And then verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Amazing thoughts. James 4.13. Go to now, you that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. To delay or hesitate is to forget Proverbs 27, 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let me tell you this. Often, often I preach we should tell somebody about Christ. I, I do that often. And I think that's a good message, don't you? Jesus, the last thing he told his disciples, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. That's in the book of Mark. Hey, I preach that. And guess what? As soon as we get out the door, we get in the car. He says, let's go so-and-so and pass this out, pass that out. She didn't want to put it off. She wants to, The Holy Spirit spoke to her heart in the service, and we go somewhere like the washerette, and we give out gospel tracts. She gave out two smiley books to two Hispanic young ladies, and they were tickled to death, tickled to death to get them. Hey, what'd you do, preacher? I got out too. I mean, I was tired. When I leave this place, I'm tired. But I'm going to tell you something. When the Holy Spirit says go, she says, I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. I'm going. You see, you may leave here tonight and say, well, that can wait till tomorrow. But you better not wait if the Lord tells you something different. Amen? Do not procrastinate. Do not put it off. The Lord tells you to go. For example, last Sunday night, sitting in Pizza Inn, the Lord told me plenty of day to talk to Ben. And he looked like he was totally occupied with what he was doing. And I argued with the Lord a couple of times, and then I finally said, Lord, I'm yours. I'm not mine. I don't belong to myself. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm yours. I'm your servant. I'll do what you say. He said, talk to him. I got up, went straight over there, and immediately I found out he was friendly to what I had to say. Praise the Lord. Amen? 
Thank the Lord for that. You say, I would walk over to a table and interrupt people. Well, you can if the Lord tells you to. Listen to this. A lady had a lawsuit on her hand, and she needed the services of an expert lawyer. And we call those in the Bible an advocate. Advocate is a Bible term. She needed an advocate or a lawyer. She was strongly urged by others to uh, secure the services of a very well-known, reputable, highly intelligent, I mean very, very, very good lawyer. But she could not make up her mind to entrust her case to anyone, whether he was that good or not. Time passed on, and at last she was compelled by others and her own need to go to this well-known, reputable, skillful, excellent lawyer and ask for his help to take her case. The lawyer said to her, Madam, you are too late. If you had come before me earlier, I would have gladly taken your case. But now I have been called to the bench, and all I can do is to hear your case and to make a judgment. You're too late. I don't know about you, but the day of grace will soon be over. Jesus Christ now is our advocate. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We do have an advocate right now. But he will not always be our advocate. One day, Jesus Christ is going to step to the bench and be our judge. How many of you know that? He is our advocate now. He is our expert lawyer now. He is our skillful lawyer. He has a high reputation. He has mighty wonderful works that have, can be put on his credentials. He, he is the best. We have an advocate right now. But one day, that advocate is going to become our judge. Think about that. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4.1, I charge thee before... Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ one day is going to be our judge at the Bema seat, at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to judge us. We're no longer going to have him as an advocate at that time. I say it would be better for us in this day of grace to use our advocate now. Immediately, don't wait. Use him now. Serve him now. And here's our last thought, last illustration. A king sent for his jester one day and presented him with a stick. And here's what he said after he gave the stick to his jester. Take this stick and keep it until you find a bigger fool than yourself. How would you like for a king to give you a stick and said, keep it until you find a bigger fool than yourself? Lying on his deathbed, the king again sent for his jester. And he said to his jester, I am going away. And the jester said, Whither? Or where are you going? The king said, To another country. And the jester said, What provision has your majesty made for this journey and for living in the country whither thou goest? The king said, None. The jester then handed the king the stick. And he said, Take it. I have found a bigger fool than myself, for I only trifle with the things of time while you are trifling with the things of eternity. Let's pray.